one of my favorite songs, and Tammy's as well, we sang it many times when we were dating and washing dishes after we got married, uh, is This World Is Not My Home. And we sang it, I asked Jeremy uh, to do that. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. That's pretty much the sentiment of what Brother Denton prayed just a second ago. That our country and our world, our society, uh, is very different than what it has been in the past. And there have been many great years in the past in, in our world, in our country. And so tonight we're going to look at the idea and the topic of this world is not my home. And I just want to affirm that, that this world is not our home. It is not our final place of abode. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? I really am. I mean, we can survive and we can hang on and we can pray and do all of the different things that, that help us to kind of get along in this world, but this world does not offer the beauties and the glories and the blessings that God has prepared for us in our final abode and home. To escape sin, we would have to go out of this world. The only way to get away from sin and the temptation of sin is to leave this world. And so as long as we live, there's that struggle. Paul said, the things that I, I don't want to do, I do, and the things that I do, I don't want to do. And it's, he was constantly uh, between the two. He knew there were things that he needed to do, and it didn't feel like he did them right or did them well. And many times I know we feel uh, that very same thing. And so since we cannot uh, escape sin, we need to avoid things in this world. I'll call it worldliness. The worldliness of this world has caught most of the people of this world by the tail and is whirling them around and controlling their lives. And so we must avoid worldliness at all costs. If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22, Paul said, abstain from every appearance of evil. That's the new King James. If you look at the King James, it says abstain from every form of evil. And so if you think about it, there are things that we see in our world or know that exist, whether on television or in movies or in concerts or programs that are basically inherently bad and evil. And those things we need to, from afar, look ahead and understand that those are the appearance of evil. There's things that we may can go to or be involved in, and it's a struggle, and I, I know it is. Uh, things that are not in and of themselves evil, but there is the appearance of evil with them. In John chapter 15, verse 18 and also verse 19, uh, Jesus uh, was speaking to his disciples. And he said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. If you were of the world, in other words, you're not of the world, disciples. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. And it says, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours uh, also. And so we need to understand that we are not to involve ourselves with things of the world, that we are not of the world as Christians. We should not be involved in the things that the world is, but we can't leave the world. And that's the great... Uh, you know, difficult thing because we have to be wise and decide what is it that, that we can be involved in in the world without sinning. In John chapter 17, verse 16, in that famous passage that says in verse 17, Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth. And you know the other part of it, your word is, is truth. 
God's word, Jesus' word is truth. But in verse 16, the verse before, he said, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And so Jesus left the beauties and blessings of heaven to come to this world to die for us, to save us, but he never was of the world in so much that he didn't involve himself in worldliness. Now, he went to weddings. Uh, no doubt he was involved in activities. I don't know if Jesus ever fished, but he was around fishermen a lot. And he was involved in different things that the world offers, not worldliness, but the world that are not inherently or in of themselves wrong or evil. Apparently he did not sin, the Bible says, and so when he went to the wedding, that was not the appearance of evil, but we need to decide and be wise, and it's hard to do. It's not easy. You can't say, you know, there's a checklist, and this is right, and, and this is wrong. I've been to concerts in the last few years when I, I felt very uncomfortable because people all around me were, were drinking and, and began to, at some point, do dancing, and, and I felt so uncomfortable. I thought, this is, this is not where I need to be. I actually went for the help and support of another person or I would not have gone. Just to say that many times there's not a, a yes or a no, but we have to be wise. Is there the appearance of evil? Is there something that's going to attract us, to involve us? If we have a drinking problem, or if we have a dancing problem, or if we have certain problems of a monastery, or whatever it may be, that may not be at all the place for you where it would not be as difficult a place for somebody else to go. And so in John chapter 17 and verse 16, Jesus said, My disciples, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then Hebrews chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, we uh, seek a, a different place, a different city. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. We have a, a city, four square, prepared in John 14, Jesus tells us being prepared for us, specifically for us. And he went to prepare a place for those that have hope of heaven. And so I want to just affirm here at the outset that this world, uh, Jesus said it, Paul said it, and we know it, this world is not our home and we cannot ever feel comfortable in this world. There's a few things that I'd like to look at because of that then. There's things that we must not do, must not be uh, involved in if we are not of this world. The first one you'll find in James chapter 4 and verse 4. And so the first one is, I must not be friends with this world. I have to live in the world until we go. You have to be in the world until you leave this life. But you do not have to be friends with this world. And I don't think we need to have to explain all the ins and outs of what it means to be friends with this world. We know what it means to have friends, that you involve yourself and, and you're always counting on your friends and, and they're supporting you and they're behind you and they're involved with you. Friends. And the Bible says, I must not be friends of this world. James chapter 4 and verse 4. He actually begins in saying, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is what? Is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy. An enemy of God. And so we have hope of heaven and we're wanting to go there, but we really need to stop and ask ourselves at times in my life, am I becoming or am I a friend of this world? Are there things that I allow to be friendly in my life. And, and Jesus, or God, says here uh, that you are adulterers and adulteress because you have friendship with the world and you want to say you are of God. And so you have left your first love. You're an adulterer. So I must not be friends with this world. And then number two, you find in James chapter 1 and verse 27, I must not be spotted by this world. James 1 and verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. We know to visit the fatherless uh, and orphans and widows in their trouble. And the last part of that says, and to keep oneself what? 
unspotted, unspotted from the world. And so the things that I involve myself in may not even be evil. They may have an appearance of evil. And so just in of, in of itself, I need to avoid that. But is there something that is spotting me? We know what that means. We know what it means when you eat a food and you drop food on yourself and it leaves a spot and it's hard to get out. And sometimes it never comes out. And if you have a solution for that, I'd like to know what it is sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to get out. But it's there. It's part of the fabric, it seems like. And so I must not be spotted by this world. Do the activities that I go to and are involved in, whether it's at a concert, a symphony, a lake, uh, a pool, wherever it is, a party, are those things that spot me? Are there things that leave me spotted? It says here that pure religion and undefiled religion is not just to do good like visiting orphans and taking care of widows, but to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And if you really think about it, that's hard. It's a full-time job to keep ourselves unspotted from the world because the world is spotting us in many different ways. And then in Romans chapter 1 and verse 33, 32, the third thing that we need to do as Christians to, to affirm and to make sure that we are not making this world uh, permanent comes from Romans chapter uh, 1 and verse uh, 32. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, it's talking about all kinds of evil people, backbiters and haters of God and violent and proud and boasters, inventors of evil things, and yes, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Well, that's not any of us. But the next verse says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do they the same, but also approve, approve, approve of those who practice them. Sometimes in our family, we may have to tell our children or our grandchildren, this is not approved by God. There are times in my life when I have to tell my children, you should not do this and you should not go there. And these are not friends that you should be around. That God, I don't approve of them and God does not approve of them. And that's important that that as a family, uh, as leaders and elders and deacons and teachers, Bible school teachers, as Christians, that as followers of God, this world is not our home, and hopefully our children understand that this world is not their home. So don't give them everything. Don't approve of everything they do. There are times as a parent or grandparent when we can tell our children that what you're doing is not approved by God, and if you're not careful, you're not going to end up where you think you're going to go. I must not be approved by this world. There are people that seek the approval of others and live for the approval of others. But I must not be approved by this world. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 17, the next one is that I must not love this world. There are things in this world that God has created, whether it's the beauty of the animals and the vegetation, uh, the, the beautiful uh, mountains and, and even people. But I must not love this world. And First John says, do not love what? Do not love the world. This world is not your home, so don't get too comfortable. Don't love it too much. Do not love the world. God loved the world that he created, but he's saying, do not love the worldliness of the world or the things in the world. In other words, don't even love the things that you own. You're not going to take them with you, so don't get too involved with the things that you have. Enjoy them for a time and let others later enjoy them. If anyone loves the world or worldliness, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of God, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's a secret and solution, is it not? How do I avoid being friends with the world and spotted with the world and approved by the world and loving the world? He says here, he who does the will of God abides forever. If you're doing the will of God, you don't have a whole lot of time and energy and thought to, to, to love the world. 
Because you're loving his church and you're loving the people that he put in the world and you're evangelizing and you're doing all kinds of things for the Lord. And that's not just preacher talk, but that is member talk. We need to be more involved in the work of the church or in your private ministry, which you can have uh, in whatever way and not love the world. But as he said here, he who does the will of God abides forever. And that is a solution and a secret to not loving the world. And then in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul was trying to teach the church at Corinth, did a pretty good job. And he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, talking to Christians by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your physical bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Are there things that are hard to do? There really are. There's times when I don't feel like preaching. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like visiting somebody. There's lots of times when we don't feel, you know what I mean? You just don't feel good. You don't feel like doing it. But your bodies are to be a living sacrifice. I'm too old. I'm too sick. And sometimes, of course, if you're sick, you don't need to be doing some visits. But wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I had a teacher one time that said most of the work that, 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 that is done in the world by members of the church or by those that are really, really tired. And he was an older man at the time, Brother Wendell Broom. That's so true. And so, you know, the elders and, and deacons and preachers and others, Bible school teachers, evangelists, did they ever get tired? <laughs> yes. Paul got tired. Jesus was tired and worn out mentally and physically and emotionally sometimes. But he says, present your bodies a, a, a living sacrifice. In other words, don't conform to this world and do not be conformed, verse 2 says, to this world or to the worldliness of the world. Enjoy the world. God has given us a wonderful, beautiful paradise almost of a world with wonderful food and things to be enjoyed, but do not be conformed to the world. Don't love the world. Don't be approved by the world. Don't be spotted by the world and don't be friends with the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you want to be approved by God and acceptable by God? What it says here, transform your mind. And you can do that through the study of God's word and through prayer and through worship. And then John chapter 14 and verse 30, I must not be controlled by this world, but I want to jump to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 32 which says that I must not be condemned with this word, at least I hope that I'm not going to be in you. 1 Corinthians 11, 32 says, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. This is actually in the context of taking the Lord's Supper and examining the bread and the drink, verse 27, and not taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, but let, verse 28, a man or woman, person, examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. Now, Brother Curtis used to say, well, we're not worthy. And he was so right. But the blood of Jesus, if we are obedient to him, makes us worthy. We're not worthy in and of himself. And so for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, you can come to church and you can sing to God and you can actually pray and you can take of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner if you are living in sin. If you are part of the world, if you're friends of the world and spotted by the world and approved by the world and love the world and are conformed to the world and yes, controlled by the world and worldliness. And so hopefully we will not be condemned with this world. But verse 32 says, when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. And so what is going to happen to this world is not going to go away with a nuclear blast and you're not going to find Israel and Gaza and all of them destroying the entire world, although it kind of looks like it. But one day the Lord is going to return, Jesus the Christ, in flaming fire, First Thessalonians, taking vengeance on them that know not God and love not his appearing. And there is a judgment day. It's appointed the man wants to die and then after the judgment, and we will be condemned with the world if we are friends, if we are friends of the world. And I know that's hard. It's hard to talk to children and grandchildren and members of the church. And we see people that are members of the Lord's body that 
are doing things that are of the world in worldly things, in worldly ways, and are being attracted to sin, and may not even realize that they are involved with things that God would not approve of. And so tonight, this world is not your home, and it's not my home. But we have hope of a heavenly home, and we seek a heavenly city that is being prepared. But to escape sin, we would have to go out of this world. You can't do that until the Lord is ready to take it. But we can't avoid worldliness, being involved in the world. And so we need to kind of evaluate ourselves and examine ourselves and think, is there things in my life that I kind of need to lop off, kind of cut out? Are there programs and activities and movies and different things that I do that, that, that God would not approve of, Jesus would not be there, that are worldliness, and not be friends with the world, and not be spotted by the world. Hopefully tonight, we can take up that challenge and take up our cross that is not easy and follow Him. If you need to come, please let us know as you stand still. Oh, yes, yes, yes.